So, in the preceding paragraphs, Kant was talking about the first aim of his book, upon writing his book, which is uh, certitude, right? He tries to be certain. He tries to distinguish when uh, he is only stating an opinion that might be questioned and uh, an assertion that he thinks is really uh, necessary or flowing from uh, the nature of the condition. The second aim that he has is not uh, certitude but now uh, clarity. And then he clarifies clarity as being uh, subdivided into two types. The first type of clarity being uh, the first type of clarity being conceptual clarity. Well, the second type of clarity is, uh, is aesthetic clarity, okay? Or ped we might say pedagogical clarity. What do we mean by these terms? Uh, let's try to flesh that out as we read um, the text from Kant, okay? Which is in his preface. We are nearing the end of his preface. Quote, Finally, as regards clarity, the reader has a right to demand the first, dis to demand first, discursive or logical clarity okay through concepts okay through concepts so this is the third first type of clarity he then says quote but then also intuitive or aesthetic clarity through intuition that is through examples or other illustrations in concreto so basically Kant is talking about two types of clarity that are uh, demanded of him as a writer of such a difficult book okay the first type of clarity is we might say clarity regarding how precise he is at capturing the most accurate term or word for a specific concept to, to stand for a specific concept so he tries to be really precise logical right in his argumentation in his premises and so on so that's the first type the second type of clarity is pedagogical clarity which is how to really bring home his point right, to the reader. It is demanded of him because if he is somebody who tries to revolutionize philosophy, right, to, to usher in a Copernican revolution in metaphysics, right, of course, uh, how would people know if they do not understand what they're reading? Okay, so this type of clarity, pedagogical clarity, is a secondary, or a second type, I'm sorry, second type of clarity that is demanded of somebody who, like Kant, tries to undertake such, difficult, such a difficult task. Then he says, quote, I have taken sufficient care for the former. Okay? So his emphasis now, he says, is the former. The former type of clarity. What was the type of clarity? It was conceptual clarity. Okay? So he seems to think here that uh, the two types of clarity are competing. Right? You have to choose between them because the first one is apparently uh, opposed to the other. He says then, quote, that was essential to my undertaking, but was also the contingent cause of the fact that I could not satisfy the second demand, which is less strict but still fair. Okay, so his choice to select the first type of clarity as an aim in his work forces him to sacrifice the second. He then says, quote, In the progress of my labor, I have been almost constantly undecided on how to deal with this matter. If you're a writer, right, especially if you're writing non-fiction, maybe even, even if you're writing fiction, if, when writing in general, you are forced to um, choose between between these two types of clarity, right? Sometimes you just need to be exactly precise. And sometimes you want more comprehensibility, right? You want more uh, understandability through more illustrations and through more examples. But uh, inevitably, including more and more examples and illustrations, although that would aid, right, sometimes or most of the times in bringing home the point, right? Sometimes it would distract the reader from the essential point which is captured through precise terminology through precise definitions through precise sentences and so on right so the first type of clarity is is um, uh, characterized by precision okay the second type is understood com uh, comprehensibility understandability from our examples and illustrations and he says that uh, he has to pick the, f the former one because the format where one is more concise and it's, it's less distracting, he, th he thinks. Quote, Examples and illustrations always appeared necessary to me and hence actually appeared in the proper place in my first draft. But then I look at the size of my task and the many objects with which I would have to do. And I became aware that this alone, treated in a dry, merely scholastic manner, would suffice to fill an extensive work. Thus, I find it inadvisable to swell it further with examples and illustrations. 
which are necessary only for a popular aim, especially since this work could never be made suitable for popular use, and real experts in designs do not have so much need for things to be made easy for them, although this would also always be agreeable, here it could also have brought with it something counterproductive. So in other words, uh, Kant is saying here that uh, anyway, only somebody who writes for a popular audience needs to include as much examples and illustrations as he needs to write or to include. But his aim is for an academic audience, somebody, uh, people who do not need as much uh, examples and illustrations than a typical person. And therefore, he takes that as a reason for his selection, right, of the first type of clarity over the second. He says, quote, the ad, ad terrasson says, that if the size of the book is measured not by the number of pages but by the time needed to understand it, then it can be said of many a book that it would be much so shorter if it were not so short. Okay? But on the other hand, if we direct our view toward the intelli intelligibility of a whole of speculative condition that is wide-ranging and yet is connected in principle, we could with equal right say that many a book would ha have much clearer, would have been much clearer if it had not been made quite so clear. So, uh, if I understand him right, Kant is saying here that uh, just as if the length of time to read a book is our basis for uh, judging how long a book is and not the number of pages, then actually sometimes the shortness of a book, right, is the reason why it's actually long, longer in the second sense, which is the length of time to read it. Sometimes it's too compact to the point that every sentence needs to be uh, mulled over many, many times before you understand it. Okay? So, in the same way, Kant says, many a book would have been much clearer if it had not been made quite so clear. Okay? So, if uh, too much emphasis on the second type of clarity here, uh, meaning too much examples, too much illustrations, would actually make it less clear right less clear in the other type of clarity the first type of clarity which is conceptual clarity or precision for the quote for the aids to clarity help in the parts but often confuse in the whole since the reader cannot quickly enough attain a survey of the whole and all their bright colors paint over and make unrecognizable the articulation of or structure of the system which yet matters most when it comes to judging its unity and soundness. So, actually, Kant is saying here that uh, his aim is for the reader to be able to see the big picture, right? And how can you see the big picture if there's too much emphasis on the details, right? On examples and illustrations. No, one could get lost in the details. And to avoid uh, that fact, uh, that, that possibility that the reader will get lost in the details, Kant then decides to proceed with the point, right? With a gist. Of what he's trying to say so he's basically Kant in his art in, in this paragraph emphasizes how there are two types of clarity that are demanded of him as a writer of the critique of pure reason just a difficult work okay but then uh, he has to select the first type of clarity meaning conceptual clarity or precision uh, and less on uh, the second type which is pedagogical clarity because too much emphasis on the second would actually uh, aid comprehension, more comprehension of the whole, right, than otherwise.